Christy was my middle sister. She was a very secure person and was very opinionated. She wasn't someone who would give in. Very cautious of her surroundings. I think it was something that was ingrained from our childhood or our parents taught us that. So when this happened, I'm like, she had to know this person. There was no way she would open that door. On a chilly morning four days before Christmas, the halls of a Lancaster elementary school buzz with holiday excitement. But something is wrong. Sixth grade teacher, 25-year-old Christy Marac is missing. Christy was never late for school. I thought, what? You know, it was just so unlike her. So I called her apartment about five times. Nothing. I left messages, Christy, where are you? We're worried about you. And that's when I called her mother. My mom was kind of in a panic saying, you know, Christy didn't show up for work today, which was really odd. We didn't know what to do. Christy's family lives two hours away. Principal Harry Goodman volunteers to check on her himself. So I pull up to her apartment and her car is iced over. And I knew something was wrong. And then I saw that her door was partially ajar. I rang the doorbell a number of times and I'm screaming her name, Christy, Christy, where are you? So I made the decision, you know, just to, to walk in to see if I could help her. I walked into the apartment and I was in total shock. I've never told anybody what I walked in on that day. It affected my whole life. I had screaming nightmares for about five years. I had intense therapy. Yeah, it, it totally changed my life. Christy was my middle sister. Christy was the kind of person that she always was smiling, always energetic. She was that kind of person also, you know, just kind of trying to make everybody laugh. This was Christy and I at our senior prom in May of 1985. It happened to be our friend's birthday that night. So we got a cake and we had everybody sing happy birthday to her and she was mortified. But Christy and I loved every minute of it because she was mortified. <laughs> and. We had such a good time. She was a very kind person. She was the kind of person that would really do anything for you. And I know a lot of people say that, but she truly was. Her dream and goal was always to be a school teacher. She knew that at such a young age, there was times she would be like, we're all going into the garage and I'm gonna, you know, have a teaching session. She would have her, you know, chalkboard up and just throw some things out there as far as just teaching for a short period of time to us. She graduated high school, went to Millersville University here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and got her degree in elementary education and teaching students. I was a principal for 27 years, and there are certain classrooms that you walk in, and the teacher is teaching, and 
you get chills. The kids were really in tune with her, and I could tell that she enjoyed what she was doing. And that's something you can't teach as a, a love of teaching. And I think she just felt like things were going all in the right direction, which it sure seemed like they were. I ran outside the door and slammed it shut, and I was in shock. I remember I was staggering, going from apartment to apartment, pounding on the door, just screaming, and finally somebody let me inside, and I called 911. Within minutes of Harry's frantic 911 call, police and rescue units arrive at Christie's apartment. When the officers entered, they did see uh, the body of a young woman to their immediate left in the living room. She had some significant facial injuries. There were marks around her neck, so potentially a strangulation was involved. She's nude from the waist down, with the exception of her socks and her clothing that she had from the waist up were, were pushed up to her uh, upper chest. Any detective would have a, a logical conclusion that there's a sexual assault involved here. It was immediately apparent that there was a struggle that ensued right inside the door, as evidenced by the scuff marks both on the floor, on the frame of the door, on the door. The struggle continued into the living room there was bodily fluid on the carpet, so they cut the carpet out around that stain, and it was eventually sent to the lab for processing and analysis. While the crime scene is being processed, Vince and his mother received the devastating news. We were told that basically there was an accident and Christy had passed. They wanted us to come down to Lancaster as soon as we could. It was the longest two hours, I think, that I ever had in a car. I think we cried more than anything. Once safely at the station, police tell the Maracs that it wasn't an accident. Christy has been murdered. It was extremely difficult on, on my mother. And at that point, it was just a sheer panic. When I found out, I don't remember crying. I really don't remember anything after. I just couldn't believe that this was happening. Back at the scene of the crime, police begin canvassing the neighborhood. A woman who lived in the same complex said that right around 7.15 that morning, she was walking her dog. She saw a light-colored or a white-colored vehicle parked in the, the overflow parking lot, which was directly across the street from Christie's townhouse. She saw what she described as a white male with a muscular-type build, stringy dark hair, exit that vehicle and walk into the area of Christie's apartment across the street. As she was observing all this her roommate came out and as they were engaging in conversation they heard this really loud kind of high-pitched scream they weren't sure if it was christy or not but it came from the direction of her apartment so the detectives developed a sketch of the person that was seen in the area that morning they wanted to get that information out to the public quickly, as well as uh, information about a vehicle that was seen. The public did call and participate in providing information that they, they thought was useful. But when followed up by police, it wasn't something that could pan out. So that was like a dead end. They were able to locate Christie's roommate she had left the apartment right around 7 o'clock in the morning. Christy usually left for work around 7.30 to 7.45 in the morning. This was 
a murder that occurred in broad daylight. So this was really a brazen act for somebody to enter into the apartment and leave without being seen. Now, whether she knew her assailant or not was unknown. Harry Goodman found the door open slightly. That doesn't necessarily mean that she opened the door. That only means that whoever did this to her left the door open. During that first day of the investigation, detectives had really hoped that they would get one piece of evidence or one interview that would immediately give them a piece of information. And unfortunately, they just didn't have that. I don't think anybody could comprehend anything that happened. The question just kept saying was, why? What happened here? Today is the last day of school here at Roarstown Elementary School before the holidays, where Christy was a sixth grade teacher. The students will all go home and try to make sense of the tragedy. There was a, a male who showed up at the school where Christy worked asking to see her. The staff said, well, she's not available. Are you sure you, you didn't hear what went on here? And he said, no, I'm not aware of what's going on. They're thinking, oh my gosh, was this somebody she knew or was it not somebody she knew? Was it a random person? So they called police right away. When the police department arrived, they were able to identify him as Dagger. Dagger happens to be Christie's ex-boyfriend, who agrees to be interviewed at the station. He gives investigators the details of his relationship with Christie. Dagger, he was almost twice Christie's age, 20 years older than, than she was. They met at the local bar. They had been in a relationship for a couple of years. She was excited that she met this guy. I was like, oh, great. And then she said, and he's married. And I'm like, just be careful. Christy kept that private. She kept that secret. Her family didn't even know about that relationship. It wasn't something that she was very open about. She was now living, you know, on her own. So I really didn't know a lot about, uh, you know, any, um, you know, boyfriend. I think Christy was just comfortable at first dating him. And then I think her friends were starting to get married. She felt like she needed to move forward. That Saturday before the murder, Christy met with Dagger, and that was the day that she ended their relationship. So when he would try to call her and check to see how she was, and she wasn't answering her phone, especially on that Monday, now he's getting concerned, and that's why he came to the school. Dagger's story seems suspicious, so he is questioned about where he'd been the morning of Christie's murder. The alibi he provided was that he had moved to Virginia to be with his wife, and at that time in the morning on, uh, on the 21st, he was actually in Virginia getting his vehicle registration and his driver's license changed to his new address at his wife's home. When that information was corroborated, his alibi checked out. He agreed to a polygraph examination, which was conducted and submitted DNA for analysis. That also cleared him. So it was very frustrating for detectives at the time. The community was on edge, and they wanted to know who had committed this, this heinous act. Things like that didn't happen in Lancaster. It's a very trusting community and very little drama. I think that changed for everybody. the day after the murder. 
Dr. Wayne Ross performed an autopsy on Christy Mirak. During the autopsy, there is the actual examination of the injuries to her neck. There was a lot of bruising, those ligature marks. There was a, a fractured jaw. Dr. Ross also determined that Christy had been sexually assaulted. The results of the autopsy revealed uh, that her cause of death was strangulation and her manner of death was homicide. During the autopsy, several swabs are also collected and sent to the lab for testing. You have to get the DNA tested. And once you come up with uh, an actual DNA profile, that is entered into HOTUS. In 1992, the combined DNA index system known as CODIS is in its infancy and only has DNA profiles of previously convicted offenders from 12 states. Investigators compare their unknown DNA samples to the limited profiles in CODIS and hope for a hit. That it was determined that there was no hit on this DNA profile. So this profile was uh, to an unknown male contributor. So investigators at the time were kind of at a loss. They didn't know whose DNA this was that had committed the murder of Christy Murak. And so what were they going to do with this DNA evidence? This could be anyone. They could be out there anywhere in the entire country. And this was really a clear whodunit. I went down there, first of all, thinking I was going to tell them about her teaching and her background. Within 48 hours of Christy Murak's murder, detectives are already hitting dead ends. So they turn their attention on the last person who saw her. The lead detective had called and said to come down to the police station and answer a few questions and they fingerprint me right away. And I'm thinking, my God, they think I did this. And they take me in an interrogation room. I was in total shock. Harry Goodman was in the crime scene, so obviously the detectives back then had to focus on him. And he started asking me questions about Christy. Did you think Christy was attractive? Were you having sexual relations with Christy? And I said to the lead detective, how dare you defame Christie's memory? How dare you defame me? And they couldn't understand, well, why would you go down there? You know, is it typical for a principal to do something like this? And I said, yeah, I was, I was worried. They wanted to polygraph me. And I said, sure, go ahead. I've got nothing to hide, hook me up. They got somebody from the state police who polygraphed me. What is your name? Where do you live? Did you kill Christy Marek? That's how it went. I was not going to allow them to intimidate me. I got into a zone. I passed the polygraph and it was incredible. I couldn't even mourn for Christy during that time. Five days after Christie's death, her family has to do the unthinkable, say goodbye. Her funeral was one of those days that I um, try to forget. It was a very painful, uh, sad day for, for, for us and our family. I remember standing in the church and like, it's one of those things where you don't hear any sounds. It was truly almost like a 
movie moment. You're there, but you're not really there. And somebody said to me, turn around. And I turned around and I looked and the church was absolutely packed. And this person said, that just shows how many people loved her. We couldn't understand why. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. How does something like this happen and no one sees or knows anything? The fact that she wasn't there with us was, is, is still the hardest thing that we deal with. As the investigation moved forward, there were at least 500 people interviewed. Detectives, they were interviewing everybody imaginable. The detectives also learned about a couple of peeping Tom incidents that occurred right there in Christie's townhouse complex. Although the peeping Tom incidents were reported and they were investigated, that led nowhere because uh, the description given was very general. They were leaving no stone unturned, trying to find information to build on and move forward. Just couldn't do it. For the next two years, few leads developed. The days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, and months turned into years. By 1995, there were at least 1,500 people that were interviewed nearly 60 people that had been cleared as suspects in this case. It was hard to believe what we were going through and still had very little answers to where we started from that day. It's just one of those things that's like gnaws at you. Like you want an answer and you don't know why you don't have an answer. And there were just simply no other leads or anything more to follow up on. And then at this point in time, the case is what investigators would uh, say became cold. It was extremely, extremely frustrating. How can we not, at this point, have anything, or at least the person who was held responsible for this? Christy Marac's murder remains chillingly cold. The passing years without answers for her family and friends only bring more heartache. I still kept in close contact with the lead investigator, but the frustration level seemed to get worse every year. Every day was a struggle. It was a struggle for my mom. She had cancer, it reoccurred. They cured her, it reoccurred. In December of 2002, my mom unfortunately passed. But she just made sure, she's like, please don't ever let this go. And I assured her I wouldn't. There was not a bone in my body that said I would give up on this. I couldn't go through life without knowing who did this and why. So around 2007, I had a uh, idea with a, another victim's family. We came up with the idea of putting up a billboard on a major highway in Lancaster. The sign said, do you know who murdered us? I mean, we wanted to make it as chilling as it was, as it was to us. We didn't get approval from the police. I basically told them this is what we were going to do. I think people driving there every day maybe look at it like, you know what? This has really been bugging me for all these years. It's time I need to talk. We did get a lot of information from the posting of that billboard. But unfortunately, nothing was concrete enough that we would uh, get an answer. The Lancaster County District Attorney's Office takes on the case, hoping to bring much needed closure to Christie's family. 
I was a senior in high school at the time that Christy Mirak was murdered. She reminded me a lot of myself and my girlfriends. I was a really young prosecutor, and it was a case that I had always wanted to work on. It was an important case to Lancaster County. It was just something that I had a vested interest in solving. When the, the district attorney's office got the case and reviewed things with me, they really reassured myself and our family that, you know, they have the confidence here that they can get this solved. I knew that the case could always be solved because of the DNA evidence. And I knew that technology was changing. I knew that um, just getting the additional resources would be able to help uh, to solve the case. Detectives Erb and Martin had gone to a conference and they learned about Parabon and how you could submit DNA and you would obtain these profiles. Through a DNA analysis, the phenotyping predicts basically a genetic makeup of a person. And it would tell you the skin tone of that person, their area or country of origin, how their face would have been shaped, their eye color, their hair color, but it can't tell you how heavy the person was or what life choices they made to affect their appearance. A second DNA test of the sample from Christie's apartment is submitted, reigniting the case. They have algorithms that they use to provide an age progression. In this case, we felt that the age of 25 would be good because that was right around the same age as our victim in this case. We also knew she dated to somebody who was 20 years older than she was, so we wanted to go to age 45 and age 55. When we saw these pictures, we were trying to think, does this look like anybody that we believe is a, a potential suspect? So we got a hold of all the people close to Christy, we looked over those images hundreds of times, trying to think of somebody that it may look like, and I couldn't pinpoint one person. We did as much as we could until we exhausted all means. So we thought, maybe we need to get this face out to more people. The phenotyping images of the killer are presented to the public. What we're doing today, hopefully, will spark uh, information, a tip, a lead um, that will finally bring some, some closure to the family. I remember seeing these pictures come out, and I, again, had that fresh hope. I had that fresh hope that, wow, this is something even further with technology, and this could be it. We're hoping that some tips that are going to be generated are going to provide us some useful information in the investigation. Well, that didn't happen. Things just weren't transpiring the way I thought they were going to. I, I got to admit, like I said, it was, it, was, it was deflating. But we all just persevered, and the goal was to never give up here. All right, we got to go back to that breaking news. We told you at the time. We were finishing dinner up, and the news was on. An arrest in the case of the Golden State Killer has been made. And I stopped for a minute and listened. We knew we could and should solve it using the most innovative DNA technology available at this time. I'm like, wait a second. This is something we need to look at. So, you know, the first thing I did was emailed Chris Erb and Christy Wilson. It was like, you know, can we look into this? this? This looks like another advancement in this technology that I didn't even know about. Twenty-five years after Christy Marek's murder, there is new hope. 
thanks to the genetic genealogy technology used to capture Joseph D'Angelo, the infamous Golden State Killer. In the Golden State case, I was made aware that there was a DNA sample uploaded into a publicly available genetic genealogy database analyzed and linked back to him. We receive an email from Parabon saying, hey, we're now offering genetic genealogy services that were used in the Golden State Killer case. We already had this, the sample was submitted to them from the phenotyping. So they used the sample we had on file from the carpet as our unknown. That's when I got started. Thanks to the original crime scene investigators, we had DNA both from Christy herself and from the carpet that was underneath her. For the phenotyping process, where images of the suspect were generated, the crime scene DNA that had already been analyzed was prepped for the genetic genealogy process. We were able to upload that to GEDmatch and then wait for the relatives to appear. When you upload a file to GEDmatch, you could get a close relative or just very distant cousins. But I was very excited when I opened up that match list and saw that there were close enough cousins that I thought there was a pretty good chance we would be able to identify the person that probably killed Christy. So once I have that match list, I need to build the family trees of those potential cousins. So I have to identify who that person is, who their parents are, grandparents, and so on. So how far back I go in the tree is really based on how much DNA a person is sharing. Once the expanded family tree reveals a common ancestor, Cece flips the tree upside down to perform reverse genealogy. Now I'm building forward in time, trying to find all the descendants of that ancestral couple. I'm looking for men who might be the right age in the right place and have the right ancestral mix to potentially be the suspect. Which leads to a specific family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that is of primarily Northwest European descent. However, I knew that the suspect was going to have some Latin American ancestry and specifically Puerto Rican because the snapshot phenotype had also predicted that the suspect was going to have some Latin American ancestry. And that meant I really needed to dig into contemporary sources like newspaper archives, social media. And I found this male who was the right age and in the right place, but I couldn't determine what his father's side of his ancestry was. So I really wanted to figure out who his father was and see if that might connect to the Puerto Rican side of the family that I needed to find. And so I dug very deep into the local Lancaster newspapers. Finally, she gets a hit. There was an article that talked about how he liked to cook Puerto Rican food because his biological father was Puerto Rican. And that was like, hallelujah. <laughs> that was the moment where I knew that Raymond Rowe was very likely Christy Marek's killer. But there aren't going to be any arrests based on what I provide. They're going to have to vet that lead. I remember just being in a state of shock. Raymond Rowe had been living in the community and had remained in the community the entire time since 1992. This person was pretty well known throughout the Lancaster community as a um, celebrity, I guess that's what you would call him. He was a DJ at house parties, which ultimately led to him becoming quite successful DJing at local nightclubs. And the moniker that he used was DJ Freeze. In later years, he became a wedding DJ that had quite a successful business. 
we were able to uh, dig deeper into his background and his criminal history, and he did not have uh, any prior felony convictions, which uh, was clear why he had not been in the CODIS database. We immediately looked to see what kind of a link that there could have been between Raymond Rowe and Christy. Did she go to the club that he was a DJ at? She enjoyed her friends. They had a good time. They went out and enjoyed Lancaster, the nightlife. In 1992, Christy and Raymond Rowe also lived in close proximity to one another. So it's really anybody's guess where they could have potentially come into contact. Raymond Rowe did strongly resemble the profiles. But in order to make an actual arrest, you have to obtain a DNA sample that is going to match the DNA sample that has been entered into the CODIS database. There was uh, surveillance teams established with uh, the assistance of the Pennsylvania State Police. The Pennsylvania State Police followed Raymond to an event at a local elementary school. And they were able to send at least one undercover trooper into the event. She was able to mingle with um, Raymond Rowe. At the closing of that event, he left behind a water bottle and a cup containing a piece of chewing gum. So the trooper was able to secure those. They were able to compare it to multiple swabs that were taken from Christie's body at autopsy. So there was no question that Raymond Rowe was responsible for this murder. I was so excited. I was excited that the family was ultimately going to have an answer. Good afternoon, thanks for coming. Today, we are announcing the arrest of Raymond Charles Rowe for the murder of Christy Murak. I got a call from the victim witnesses office in Lancaster, who I've worked with since day one, and she called to tell me that, you know, they just made an arrest. And then I was like, who? And, you know, when they said the person's name, I had no idea. He is being charged with one count of criminal homicide. When I saw the press conference, at first I was shocked. And I went from shock to being very angry because I finally had a face to put that anger to. It almost brought me to my knees when I saw that they made an arrest. I, it was, Surreal. I never gave up. I've always had faith this was going to get solved. Thankfully, by the grace of God, we um, got the answer we need. Christie's case was and is the most personally satisfying case of my career to date. It was something that really took a lot of perseverance. I think it really just goes to show you that if you stick with something, then you'll get the end result that, that you hope for. On June 25th, 2018, Detective Herb interviews Raymond Rowe. During the course of the interview, he was denying having any contact with her. He denied knowing her, having anything to do with her. But I, when I mentioned the peeping Tom, he kind of distanced himself by leaning back away from me. And then we were able to eventually 
get to the vehicle that was seen in the area of the murder the day that the murder happened, he came around and admitted that, yes, he had a white Toyota Celica. Everyone wants to know motive, but our working theory is that he was potentially obsessed with her and had stalked her and had been the peeping Tom and had watched her and tracked her movements uh, leading up to this crime. But as far as what the exact motive was, is anyone's guess here. It blows my mind. He saw everything. I'm sure he saw everything. You know, the, the newspaper articles, the news. I mean, everything was right there. It doesn't sit well with us. Um, the fact that um, somebody blatantly ignored a family's cry for help, um, did what they did, uh, it takes a real sick person to be that way, I believe. To avoid the death penalty, Raymond Rowe pleads guilty to murder in the first degree, rape, and burglary. He is sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus 60 to 120 years. I think that we definitely were able to get justice for Christy and also for her family. It's reassuring to know that her killer will spend the rest of his life in prison. Knowing Christy like I did, she would be one that would have forgiven him. And I know that she's at peace. I know that she's with her mother. And I can't wait to see her. And I will. And I'll give, give her a huge hug and say, Christy, you made such a great impact on everybody. From Christy, I learned how to just live in the moment and be happy. You don't have to think so far ahead in your life that you start to worry about things. It's going to work out. She just wanted to be happy in the moment. It seems like forever ago that we were all together, but um, definitely see her smile in all these pictures. Like I remember it like it was yesterday. I wish we all could be together because um, I would just like to restart from where we left off at and just keep continuing life the way it should have went. Jessica's murder became the biggest unsolved murder case in the state. It's hatred of somebody taking your 17-year-old kid and killing her. My God, we had a killer in the neighborhood. You see this little girl, it's bad. The shocking thing about this case was that it was right there in front of them. Nobody did a thing about it. When an investigation runs out of leads, it becomes a cold case. Years pass, and hope fades. But for the families of the victims, these cases are never cold. The truth takes time. It's early morning in Bullitt County, Kentucky. The Dishon family goes about their usual routine, but lets 16-year-old daughter Jessica sleep in. When Jessica's mother comes back from grocery shopping, Jessica's bed is empty. Her car is parked out front, and her cell phone reads 9-1.
Shepherdsville as a community is a town where everyone knows everyone and everyone else's business. It's a very remote area with generation to generation to generation of the same families. In this small town, Jessica's murder became the biggest unsolved murder case in the state. September 10th, 1989, was just like any other morning. About 5.30, I would get up, be ready to go to work. I walked in and out to her car, kissed her bye. Then I come in and got Bubby and Chris up. I told them, I said, get up, boys. I got to go to work now. I looked in Jessica's bedroom. She was asleep. And I went out and got my truck, and I went to work. The boys would catch the bus, and then about 6.30, I guess Jessica would be getting in her car headed to school. When I got home, I look around, and I'm hollering, Jessica, Jessica trying to figure out where she's at. Around 1, 30, Edna called me and asked me if I had to go to school that day. I said, no, I didn't take her to school. She said, well, is her car working? I said, I don't know why. She said, well, it's here in the driveway. I said, well, you got a key to it. Go out there and see if it'll start. I opened the door. I knew something was wrong. Her purse, one shoe, everything that she would have had with her was in her vehicle. I pulled in, and then it's a white. There's something wrong. We found a cell phone with 91 dial on it. We was thinking that she maybe was trying to dial 911 for help, that she's in trouble. It was like I couldn't breathe, that I just knew something was wrong. I called the school, but they said she hadn't been to school that day. We went down to the sheriff's department about five o'clock and we told him what was going on. He told me, he said, well, maybe she's a runaway. I said, no, she's not no runaway with one shoe on and one shoe off. They told us to go home and then come back that next morning. Like someone's got to help, you know. Our daughter's missing and no one wants to help. So the day that Jessica Dishon was reported missing, State police should have been called in immediately. Her car is in the driveway. There is one shoe in the car. The other one is missing. A female's prized possession is her purse in the car. That should have been termed as a critical missing person. <laughs> We went back to the police station. It was pretty early. We told them, you all told us that she didn't come home. Come back down, we're down here. What are you all gonna do? After that, you know, they sent some cops up here. I figured they swore in this place, you know. But only two officers pulled up. He searched Jessica's car, no gloves, no nothing. If there were any fingerprints on the car before, he had messed them up because his hands was already all over the car, too. Then they got back in the car and went back to Shepherdsville. There's an abandoned car, a missing girl. Wouldn't you think there was something wrong and maybe you needed to take further action? Immediately, the car should have been impounded and the investigation should have started at that point because there's a girl that's still missing.
I don't think the police is doing their job. If they was doing their job, they would be here. The Dishon family would get on TV and accuse my husband of not doing his job. And that's understandable. They wanted to know, wanted to find their daughter. Of course, there's their child. You know, if that was my child, they couldn't do enough for me either. We miss her. We just want her back. The only people that ever looked for Jessica was the people that lived here in the community. My brother Stanley, he said, well, if somebody was going to kill anybody and put them in the woods, they'd put them in the river bottom. The River Bottoms, it's a very spooky, eerie place. The first time I was down there, it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Anything that could happen down in Bullock County that's bad, it'll usually happen down in the River Bottoms. We wanted to search, even though it was rough on the family. Stanley, my brother, he got sick. And they had to take him home because he started vomiting. We all looked. We didn't find nothing out there. It was kind of hard to come back home when Jessica was still missing. Well, we couldn't sleep. And uh, she was in there making the beds. I was doing the dishes. Chris goes out to feed the dogs. And Chris runs in the house. I said, Dad, I think I heard Jessica holler, help me. So I run in my bedroom. I got my gun. And out the door I went. I went to find her. And if I caught somebody with her, whoever it was. I was going to kill him. I got my gun, and out the door I went. I went to kill. When we run out the door, my brother Stanley was pulling in the driveway. And he asked me, he said, what's going on? I said, Chris said he thought he heard Jessica Holler help. And he said, well, come on. We jumped the fence. We went up on the hills. We start looking around the pond. There's somebody burning a bunch of clothes up on the hill. And it was Bucky Brooks. The properties of the Dishons and the Brooks family were adjacent to one another. And at that point in time, the relationship between those two families was boiling over. When Jessica come up missing, Bucky Brooks kept harassing us. Bucky called us on the phone, breathed hard on the phone, and he hollered, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. Like he knew that maybe Jessica was pleading for her life. So that night, I asked Bucky if we could search their farm for Jessica. The Brookses, they was the only people that did not want their farm search. It made me think of Bucky Brooks's involvement. Everything that I seen and heard, it leads back to them. I called the police department and tell them what's going on. The cops came, they come in the house and wanted to know what clothes that Jessica had on that night. She come up missing and it was a pink pair of shorts. We searched all the fields on Bucky's property. His barn, his garage, everything. When 
we were searching the barns. Bucky, he, he just was acting strange. The cadaver dogs picked up a consent in Bucky's fire pit. They had two pairs of jersey gloves. The jersey gloves had decomposed body smell on them. But they wouldn't arrest Bucky Brooks. That kind of pissed me off. You know, I was mad about it. The sheriff's office was not moving at a pace that the Dishon family thought that they should have. So Mike Dishon then called the FBI and said, I need your help. The FBI said, the only time that we can come in here is if the sheriff department invite us or if one of the parents. I said, well, I'm Mike Dish, and I'm Jessica's dad. I'm inviting you in. When the FBI arrived, I looked at the Bullock County Sheriff's Department, and I said, look, all you little Keystone cops can go back to Shepherdsville now. I got the big dogs in. The FBI looked at Jessica's room, and they took some of her stuff and checked for fingerprints. The FBI said, well, we need to take Jessica's car. I said, take it. You know, I said, anything in here you need to take, you take, because I've got nothing to hide. The FBI has called into helicopters. They flew over to the pond, and they hovered over the pond up there. You know, then they brought guys in, and they walked the pond, you know, to make sure Jessica wasn't put in that pond. The FBI started doing all the evidence collection, the search, everything. The search was done on the Brooks Farm. They showed me a picture that they found in the barn. It was Jessica. It became very difficult for anyone involved in the investigation to just dismiss Bucky Brooks as a suspect. Bucky Brooks appeared to be the prime suspect, but we still didn't know where Jessica Dishon was. Jessica Don Dishon, that's her full name. I was 17 when I had Jessica. It's a long day. Yeah, I was in labor like 12 hours. When she was a little girl, I used to take her hunting. I used to put her up on my shoulders and take her back in the woods and go hunting with her, you know. And we had we had a good time. of mine, Karen Hobbs is her name. She was coming from Mount Washington in her vehicle. She cut through the river bottoms. She happened to glance over and, and there set something up against a tree. And she went and called the police. She says that she thinks she's found a body. The FBI forensic team arrived on the scene. The body was decomposed. It was completely unrecognizable. Part of her limb was gone, some of her fingers. It was terrible. Well, I mean, my God, we had a, a murderer, a killer in the neighborhood. Once the body had been found, the FBI forensic team had arrived on the scene. It appeared to be the body of Jessica Dishon. Then right at dusty dark, I seen Paul Parsley come down the road with his lights on. 
pulls up, he gets out. Comes up and he says, we found Jessica. I said, well, is she alive? He said, no, she's dead. Then Edna jumped up and said, now won't you tell me she's a damn runaway? We try to tell y'all she did not run away. I told him, I said, no, I can't. I said, I can't go see Jessica like that. I got there and fell on my knees. Couldn't really tell it was her from her face. But then I seen her butterfly tattoo on her side. And I knew that was her. <laughs> and I was just devastated. The medical examiner makes the determination the cause of death was strangulation. And I've told her brothers, Bubby and Chris, Jessica wouldn't be back, but she was dead. They started crying and things, they took it hard. They told us that she had a broken jaw. Some of her fingers were cut off. She was alive for three days. She wasn't killed from day one. I was thinking for those three days, Knowing that she didn't have food, she didn't have water, I wanted everybody to know that Sheriff's Department, they're not even doing their job right. We're a small department. Only had two detectives. They were working it every day and night. You see this little girl growing up. Excuse me. It's bad. The FBI interviewed Bucky Brooks. Bucky was caught in several untruths. Bucky landed himself right in the middle of this investigation when he told the police that he had seen Jessica walking down the road that morning that she came up missing. When the FBI did a follow-up, he said, well, there's no way I could have seen Jessica because I was still having sex with my wife. And Irene tested, would give information to the FBI. We didn't have sex that morning. His statements repeatedly were proven to be inaccurate and false. It don't take no rocket scientist to figure this out. Bucky Brooks got something to do with it. And then the FBI did a polygraph exam. And the polygraph test result, although inadmissible in a courtroom, is a tool that prosecutors use to make decisions about a particular case. He failed a polygraph. The FBI hand over all the information to the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, and there is a grand jury indictment brought against Bucky Brooks. He earned the indictment, and he earned his way in front of a jury in the courtroom. Reality kicks in when you finally see him face to face. You don't know how bad I wanted to kill him. Bucky Brooks was charged with murder and was facing the death penalty. The first day of the trial, the media was all there. I was feeling very confident that day. When Bucky came through the room, my heart just was racing really high. Things started well for the prosecution. We asked him what he would say if Jessica's body was found and his fingerprints were found on the body. And he responded, quotes, 
If you find my fingerprints, I'll have to admit it. The defense wanted to prove that the entire investigation was handled very, very bad. The body parts were left out to rot. Across the top in red letters it says, Keep frozen. And here it says, Keep frozen. Keep frozen. Was it ever kept frozen? No, sir. Defense calls uh, James Coulter. James Coulter had a bad reputation in the town. He was running drugs. The defense attorneys thought that he could be responsible for the death of Jessica Dishon. Did you see Jessica Dishon the day before she disappeared? Yeah, I seen her at four, about four, four in the afternoon, Thursday. And how did you know her? I was pretty much her drug dealer. You know, I mean, I'm ashamed of that now, but that's how I, we was acquainted. But the sheriff's office basically just says it could be nobody else other than Bucky Brooks. He was the last one seen her alive. Detective Charlie Mann was hounded on the witness stand repeatedly. Why did you charge my client? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? He finally just belts out. I just, he failed a polygraph, I think, the issue to him. Jeff. The whole premise behind a polygraph exam is to get a confession. That's it. Only that confession is admissible in court, as long as the word polygraph never comes up in your testimony. The court ruled that there was a mistrial, and the trial itself stopped. It's over. The jury is dismissed. Everyone leaves the courtroom. I give a judge cussing. Nobody in this courtroom can stand up and tell me and her no. that they know how we feel when somebody come in our yard and talk our 17-year-old daughter out of my yard. Edna start crying. Edna, your thoughts? Excuse us. Really wasn't much we can do. It's up to the Commonwealth whether or not they're going to bring charges against that man again. A mistrial does not mean the defendant is not guilty. Bucky Brooks could be tried again if they found more evidence. They'd never try to find nothing else on Bucky or nothing. You know, that was it. It's a waiting game. We're still waiting. You know, when is it ever going to, someone going to be arrested? It was like no one ever had any plan of charging anybody with this crime. I didn't get justice for Jessica. The Commonwealth attorney turns the evidence back over to the family and goes, here you go, you can have it all. Which is pretty indicative that Bucky's never going to get charged anymore, and neither is anybody else. The Jessica Dishon case just goes cold. With Bucky's case declared a mistrial, the Dishon's last hope for justice disappears, leaving Edna and Mike alone to deal with their anger and their grief. Went to her room just about every day and Looked at her pictures and told her that I loved her and knows that we're not giving up on her and kind of made me feel better knowing that so have some type of contact with her. I didn't change that room since Jessica come up missing. People would tell me a lot of times when somebody loses a family, it pulls them apart, you know. Just one thing after another. She just come and told me she wanted a divorce. I said, okay. I couldn't take it anymore. I lost my kid, I lost my wife too, you know. We still don't talk. The sheriff's office wanted to hire me to look at their old murder cases, and that was my passion. Jessica Dishon's case, because of the enormity of that case, became the first. Being the new person makes the case doubly hard. It's not just being the new person, either. It was a woman. 
There was many people probably intimidated by me, but I really didn't care. I was there to do a job. When I started the investigation, I had such little paper information there in the sheriff's office. Mostly, it was just loose-leaf paper thrown in boxes, napkins, sticky notes. No phone numbers of individuals that they had interviewed, no birth dates, no addresses, no nothing. Soon after that, I went to Mike Dishon's home and sat down and met with Mike and Bubby just to tell them that I was going to reopen the case. She was a very nice lady. I think she knew what she was doing. You know, better than some of these hicks that we had out here. In Jessica's room, Bubby points me to the closet. And he turns around and he hands me a pink with flowers hat box. Inside there was her shoe, her billfold, her cell phone, all the evidence that was left in the car. I left with it and brought it back to the office and we entered it into evidence. During the time that Bucky was on trial, they had also hired private investigators to assist in the defense case. So I was wanting to know all the information that they had gained. So I borrowed a box truck, and I went to the defense attorney's office and obtained all of the boxes with the case file information from the trial of Bucky Brooks and hauled them all back to the sheriff's office. The defense had a true investigation going a lot better than I think the prosecution did. Digging through the files, lo and behold, but what do I find? New information regarding Bucky Brooks. It was an enormous break in the Jessica Disham murder case. I found Bucky's mental evaluation. It stated that he had an IQ of 61. Bucky Brooks never should have been given a polygraph exam with that low of IQ. There's no way they can understand the questions, let alone understand how they're answered. I wasn't 100% sure if Bucky was innocent. But if Bucky didn't do it, I needed to prove who did. Right away, it was very clear that the defense believed that there were suspects other than Bucky Brooks. The defense had a lot of circumstantial evidence involving the drug dealing James Coulter. During the trial against Bucky Brooks, Coulter became important to the defense. This is called the alternate perpetrator theory, that Coulter had committed the crime of kidnapping and murder. However, because of the mistrial, the defense never presented a case. But no one thought to follow up after the trial. Coulter was in jail. So I go down, pay him a visit. The morning that Jessica disappeared, he told me he was in a hotel with a female and did not check out until sometime the next day. I asked him if he had seen anybody that morning, and he said the maintenance guy had came by. I went to the hotel, but the hotel, of course, did not have any records back that far at all. As I'm leaving, I find out the same maintenance guy, he was still working there. He had seen the trial, and he remembers it. James Coulter and his girlfriend, he clearly remembered that they had checked out around noon. That verified the alibi. After all that time, there was not one single piece of evidence to point in a direction of anyone. I felt just a deep sadness. Will we ever solve it? I get a call from a detective that I used to work with who had some information regarding the Dishon case. The 
prison. The informant had told him he knew who killed Jessica Dishon. I had some apprehensions because the informants were shaky at best. But I knew that maybe we were on to something. The informant at the penitentiary had told me about an inmate who was placed in the same cell with him. Both of them had been charged for having sexual relations with children. And the inmate said he had committed the murder against Jessica Dishon. In your best recollection, tell me what you remember the suspect telling you in regards to the Jessica Dishon murder. He stated that he had Jessica for a couple of days, and then he took her life. The reason he did a mutilation to her, he was trying to make it look like some drug dealers or a cartel done that to her. That particular inmate had no independent knowledge of the facts that he was relating to Detective Hunt, other than to have listened to someone who was present when she was killed. So why was he pissed off again? She was having a relationship with a boy her own age, someone that she had found that she liked. He kept calling that boy a little bastard and a little bitch and calling her names. And that's when he told me who killed Jessica Dishon. I had a conversation with an inmate. He says that he knows who killed Jessica Dishon. And that's when he told me. Jessica's uncle, Stanley Dishon, committed the murder. Stanley Dishon was Mike's brother on the first morning of the search when they got within a mile of where the body was. Stanley became physically ill. He stated that he almost had his brother down by the body at one point. So he just quit looking for her, just quit looking for her. The informant said Stanley had tortured her in a barn that was close by to where the body was dumped, and it was some location of where the kids used to party at. And he stated that some of her personal belongings is under a tree that's fallen in that area. I needed to find one piece of physical evidence to be able to corroborate all this information. So we go down to the river bottoms, and start digging. And it rains, and it rains. And we keep digging, and we keep looking, and we keep digging. Bubby, Jessica's brother, stays to help me. I've done dug at least 175 holes down here. And after about six or seven hours, we're all soaking wet. We decide, let's just forget it. Let's tear down the grid. We are never going to find the shoe. Bubby and I get in the car. So as Bubby and I are driving, he goes, that's where all they used to go to party at. And I stopped dead in the middle of the road because clearly there was a building and a barn there. We walk in the first building. It's dark. Half of the roof is missing, so it was only part of the light that we had. and I see a piece of material sticking out from mud and sand. And all kinds of junk just thrown on top of it. So I start pulling it out. And I said, 
That looks strangely like your sister's comforter that's on her bed. I said, what are the chances it's the same pattern? We drive as fast as we can with the sheet in the car directly back to his house because her room hasn't changed since the murder. Pull the comforter back, pull the blanket back, and guess what's not there? The fitted sheet. Nothing but the mattress. It was an oh shit, it wasn't an oh my god moment, you know? I think the informant was telling the truth. I feel sure now that Stanley Dishon had murdered his niece. Stanley Dishon had been raping and sodomizing Jessica Dishon for years. The morning that she came up missing, Stanley went to the Dishons. He knew what time Mike and Edna would leave for work. He knew what time that Chris and Bubby were going to begin in on the school bus. An argument ensued. Jessica had a new boyfriend. Jessica apparently was threatening Stanley. If he didn't leave her alone, then she was going to tell the boyfriend everything that he had done to her when she was a little girl. Stanley lost his mind because he knew that Mike Disham would kill him. He knocked her out. He had broke her jaw. and he got her to a barn. She was kept for three days and tortured. And that's when he strangled her. Well, I was upset, yeah. I was devastated. How could someone that, you know, that's lived with you and you've taken care of, how can they do that? Lynn Hunt told me, she said, you know, I'm going to indict your brother. I said, well, if he done it, I want the death penalty. Lynn Hunt began to talk to the family members about Stanley. We discovered more victims through the investigation. One victim that we met with, I said, did something happen between you and Stanley Dishon? And she stood up and just passed out. He had started raping her from the time she was six years old with threats of violence, threats of guns. It ended up being a total of three other family members. He was not only on the hook for murder and kidnapping, but for multiple counts of rape with several different victims. It would have been very difficult for victims to have to get up there and tell a courtroom full of strangers that Stanley Dish had raped them. For that reason, we chose to just take the plea deal and be done. Mike and Edna now have the truth of what happened to Jessica. But detectives find a final piece of information that will haunt the Dishons forever. When I went through the defense files, I pull out the seventh box, and inside the box was a letter from a second informant, 2002. The letter said, I am an inmate and I was in the cell with Stanley Disham where he admitted he killed his niece and he dumped the body in the river bottoms. He not only confessed, but he had done it back in 2002. 
It's disgusting to think that it had been there for so long. The Commonwealth and the Sheriff's Office all had a copy of this letter, and basically they didn't do anything with it. The shocking thing about this case was not that Stanley Dishon had murdered his niece. The shocking thing about this case was that they knew this back in 2002 when they had Bucky Brooks on trial and nobody did a thing about it. I didn't believe it. He was my brother. I gave him a home. I fed him, got him a job. It's hatred, you know what I'm saying? Of somebody taking your 17-year-old kid and killing her and raping her. Sitting in prison is not justice. I have to work every day to pay taxes for him to be able to stay in prison after what he did to my, my Jessica. That's not justice. Stanley will be 70 some years old when he gets out and I'll be waiting for him. I can't even describe the pain that we went through. Even now, it takes my breath away. I don't think I could have felt worse if somebody would have ripped my chest open with their bare hands and pulled my heart out while I was still beating it. I don't think it would have hurt that bad. Pam was in a hurry to live life. She couldn't wait to get out there into the world and make her mark. When you're dealing with a case that's going on and on unsolved, every day it drains you because you can't take your mind off of it. You just feel like, how can it keep going on like that and nothing happen? No suspects. It is a crisp fall day in the picturesque town of Prescott, Arizona. 19-year-old Prescott resident Pamela Pitts phones her father, Paul. Pam wanted to know what I was doing, and I told her I was working. And she said, well, I wanted to talk to you about something. I said, well, uh, why don't we have dinner at Murphy's Restaurant here in Prescott? Pam lives in a small house on Lincoln Street with two roommates. She'd moved in just three months ago. But over dinner with her father, she admits she's already having second thoughts. She says, we're behind on the rent. And she goes, I'm tired of it. And I want to know if it would be OK with you if I moved back home. And I told her, absolutely. I didn't want you moving out to begin with. And I said, um, when do you want to do this? She said, well, I'm going to come to the house on Saturday and do laundry. So we finished having dinner, and uh, she left. And that was the last time I saw Pam alive. Pam was born June 25th, 1969, at K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where I was stationed with the 410th Bomb Wing. Being a first-time dad was great. I love being a, a dad, and Pam was a happy baby. She was very active. She was uh, very loving and fun and friendly, and she was a real joy in my life, a real joy in my life. She loved to swim. She liked uh, riding her bike. She liked getting out in the woods, hanging out with friends and her, hanging out with her brothers and sisters. Pamela was the oldest of the four of us. Pam was about two years older than I am. Stacy is my younger sister. And then Paul Jr. is the youngest. 
Pam was very much outgoing. She was part of a group of friends that liked CB radios, and her handle was Dark Angel. Pam was not afraid of the limelight. I was more of the reserved, shy, quiet one. She always looked out for me. She was, she was a pretty good big sister. By 1988, Pam's mom and dad separate. The children stay with Paul while their mom, Carol, moves to Casa Grande, two hours south. Pam quits school her junior year. She's working at a local sandwich shop, but she stays connected with her high school friends. She was a very active teenager. She was in a hurry to live life. She couldn't wait to get out there into the world and make her mark. Pam wanted her independence. In June of 1988, she moves in with her best friend, Shelley Norgard. I said, uh, I'm, I'm opposed to that. You've got your own room here at home, you got your own private entrance, but she did anyway. I was kind of upset about that, to be honest with you. They realized they weren't able to afford the rent fully, so then they had a third roommate, Jeremy Anderson, who had moved in with them. From what I remember, the three of them got along pretty well. Saturday, Pam did not show up to do laundry. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, they're kids. I mean, as a parent, you just kind of roll with that. Then later that evening, I get a call from Shelly. She says, uh, Pam took off, and I don't know where she's at. She goes, is she at your house? And I said, no, haven't seen her. She was supposed to be here today. And she says, well, well, I'm worried about her. You know, in the 80s, we didn't have cell phones like we do today, so it was a little harder to stay in touch. We weren't super concerned because Pam liked to go hang out with friends and do stuff. I said, maybe she's decided to stay at a different friend's house for the night or something. She has to work on Monday, so we'll find out what's going on then. Monday came, and I called the place where she works, and I asked her boss, I said, is Pam there? And he goes, no, she didn't show up for work. So at that point, they called the police department. I went to Pam's house with uh, a sergeant by the name of Bill Hobbs, and the door was answered by Shelly Norgard. Shelly, do I have your permission to search Pam Pitt's room and the community area, which would be like the living room? Yes. So they found Pam's purse, her driver's license, medicine, all her personal effects were still there. Bill Hobbs and myself sat down at the kitchen table with Shelly, and asked her if she knew anything, and she said that she believed Pam had gone out partying. She wasn't really worried of anything happening to her. And she said that they had a joint checking account to, to pay the rent. And Shelly deposited her portion of it, and then Pam Pitt said emptied the account and wasn't paying the rent, and so she was a little upset about that. I didn't have really anything to say that her words were really that unusual. I was rooming with somebody, and they stole my money that took to pay the rent. I'd probably be very upset, too. As police look for Pam, Paul Pitts begins his own search for his daughter. He starts at the high school. In 1988, I was the assistant principal at Prescott High School. My responsibility was student services. In May of 2013, I started working for the Avapai County Sheriff's Office as a cold case investigator. Well, I only met Pam once. She was very respectful to me. I remember that phone call from her father wanting to know if anyone at the school had seen her. And a couple days later, I remember reading in the Prescott Courier that she was a missing person. It was very stressful while Pam was missing. Obviously, 
We were in school. My dad was still trying to work and looking for my sister. My parents were separated. We were in survival mode, hoping that Pam would walk through the door. I believe a gentleman and his wife were out at Gordo's Pit. Gordo's Pit is in a wooded area. It was a place that a lot of the local kids would go to party. And so this one person is sifting through some refuse, and he sees a human foot sticking out. There was a big pile of garbage bags, and then laying on top of the pile was an unknown body that had been totally consumed by fire. Melted into the wrist bones was what appeared to be a bracelet. And you could make out just a couple of letters of dark and a couple of letters of angel on that. Dark Angel, Pam's CB handle. About the only way they were able to really prove that it was Pam was through dental records. The search for Pamela Pitts is over. A hunt for her killer begins. It was horrific. Somebody had to be a very evil person and very angry to have done this to another human being. Police came to my house and they said that they had found Pam's body and that it was an apparent homicide and that her body was burned beyond recognition. Police cordon off the area located seven miles northwest of town and start to process the scene. There was a lot of trash around her and on her. The injuries to her body were gruesome. The sheer brutality of what happened to her was the most striking thing. The body was burned so bad that they couldn't get it in the body bag without it falling apart but it was taken to the medical examiner's office where the autopsy was performed. He noted there were fractures in the skull that he said were caused by heat, but no obvious cause of death could be determined at autopsy. During the autopsy, the ME identified heat-killed fly larvae. So we suspected that Pam had been killed and stored somewhere and then deposited on the garbage pile and burned. Two local law enforcement agencies, the Yavapai Sheriff's Office and the Prescott Police, form a joint task force to track down Pam's killer. Basically, they started going to the high school and interviewing people. They literally conducted hundreds of interviews of people in this case. Since I was the assistant principal when law enforcement came to the high school, they interviewed the students in my office. They learned from a couple individuals that Pam had been seen the night of the 16th at Gordo's Pit at a big party. Law enforcement did speak to an individual that told them about a incident after the party that night wherein Pam was killed in a ritual. Tell me what you know about the Pam of Pit situation. I was with half track. He was all joking around saying that he had to kill some girl, saying that he finally made his first sacrifice to Satan and all this stuff. Everybody seemed to go by a nickname. This kid named Half Track came up as having told people that he took Pam up into the woods. He said that he took a little ice pick, he stuck it in her juggler vein, and he bled her for a little while. And then he set her on fire. But Half Track himself never gave this information to law enforcement, and none of this was ever corroborated by law enforcement. Everybody was talking about the occult. They call it the satanic panic of the 80s. 1988 was just past the peak of the satanic moral panic in the United States. 
The rumors were that there were satanic cults that existed secretively within communities and were engaging in criminal behavior, even rape and homicide. Police in Mexico arrested another suspected member of a satanic cult of drug smugglers. They're blamed for the ritual killing of 15 people at a Mexican ranch. Authorities say as many as 30 teenagers may have been involved in the satanic cult. A young mother was trying to burn the devil out of her son by putting him in an oven. The, the satanic threat was everywhere, everyone, and everything during that period of time. In the Pitts case, I think the unusual method of homicide and discovery of the body probably lent itself to satanic interpretations and satanic rumors. I think the police have to do due diligence in looking at claims, remembering during that period of time that there's still a lot of cultural discourse about satanic cults and Satanism. The rumor in the news was Pam might have been involved in that sort of thing, and I can tell you that was not true. That's the power of emotion, the power of fear, the power of moral outrage, eclipsing anything that's factual. Detectives discard the satanic ritual angle and turn to Pam's housemates, Shelley and Jeremy. They want to know where the two were on September 16th, the last day anyone saw Pam alive. Jeremy's alibi was that he was at a football game that night, and that was kind of a significant event. And then he hung out with a couple guys. Shelly said that on the night of the 16th, she got off work. She went and picked up her boyfriend, Ray. Who were you with the night of the 16th? Ray, Don. John and Terry. I don't know their last names. Did you go partying that night? No, nope, I went and met Don at about 8 o'clock at Jack in the Box. We went over to Terry and John's, and we watched Robocop. And she said that they got done around 2.30 or so in the morning. You sure you didn't take Pam out to the pits? I'm positive. So the police focused on that talking to Ray Clerks to see if uh, Shelley was telling the truth, and they corroborated what she had said. Detectives ask Ray to take a polygraph. He agrees and passes. Just as detectives move on from Pam's roommate, a new possible suspect emerges. It's been rumored Melinda Perry did pick fights with people. So there was a party at Gardo Pitts, and it was rumored that she was at this party. There was a person who said that at the party on the 16th, Melinda and Pam had gotten into a, a physical confrontation. She went after, after Pam in the pits, and, and they started to fight. And during the fight, Pamela got thrown on the ground. She just kicked her head like a good four or five times. She got up and she was bleeding and she fell back down. How was she bleeding? Through the head? From the head? head? Yeah. Some of them theorized that Melinda Perry killed her to finish the fight. And then once that had happened, that she had thrown her body on the fire. I never actually saw Melinda fight anybody, so I don't know if that was true, but. Um, it's it's possible. All you can think about is my poor kid and what kind of horror she went through. But you just want to find out who did it. It was all I could think about, day and night. Investigators have a new lead in the murder of Pamela Pitts. Melinda Perry had a reputation as being kind of a troublemaker. That was the indication that I was getting from the police department. They really went after Melinda Perry as the primary suspect.
Police bring Perry in for questioning. They ask where she was the night Pam was murdered and whether she and Pam fought. Okay, with these right this is on right. Pitts, right? Yes. Okay. I haven't been at the pits in like two months. Every time I go out there, cowgirls start stepping up to me. And we've had witnesses that have seen you at the pit on Friday night. I'd say it's a lie because I was not at the pits. <clears throat> Tell us about the fight you got into with Pam. I didn't get in a fight with Pam. I've never been in a fight with Pam. I didn't tell anybody I did. Some people that's very close to you told us that you got in a fight with her. Nope, I sure did not. To get to the bottom of all the conflicting stories and Perry's denials, detectives ask the Yavapai County attorney to convene a grand jury. They've heard enough times that Melinda Perry was responsible for Pam's death that they were going to compel witnesses to tell the truth under oath. So they started this investigative grand jury. They interviewed Melinda Perry. And then they interviewed several other subjects to get to the truth of Pam's killing. Melinda tells the grand jury exactly what she told police, that she had nothing to do with Pam's murder. Melinda had an alibi and a pretty strong one. And it was those guys that were musicians that played in some of the local establishments in Prescott. Friday night, we had a party at the American Motel. I can you? show you Scott and Jeff. We left their jam room and we went to the motel from their jam room. Maybe you got in a fight with Pam, and I remember. No, I sure did not. I always prefer fights. Four months after Melinda takes the stand, the grand jury reaches a shocking conclusion. The investigative grand jury ended up indicting Melinda Perry for perjury, essentially because she didn't confess to killing Pam and made no progress in getting any further into the investigation as to what happened to Pam. Melinda sticks to her story that on the night of the 16th, she was partying at a motel with her friends and a band. The grand jury talked to some of her people, and they said the same thing. And so they sent one of the patrolmen to the American Motel to see if this person signed his name on the ledger. And sure enough, his name was there. On December 20th, 1989, Melinda Perry is sentenced to 41 days in jail for contempt of court and failure to pay fines. But the three counts of perjury are dropped in October 1990. We were focused on what was going to come out of the grand jury in 89. I actually thought that that would be what broke this case open. And it just it fizzled out. And they wouldn't even talk about what was in the grand jury because it was sealed. With no new leads to fuel the investigation, like the dying embers of the fire that consumed her, the case of this dark angel's fiery demise grows cold. I mean, they were pretty good about periodically updating me for a while, you know, and then as time went on, I wasn't hearing much of anything. I never forget you think about her constantly. Yet this case, with all its strange twists, was about to take another odd turn. There were some Embry-Riddle students exploring a mine out uh, Iron Springs Road, found a body in a vertical mine shaft and reported it to law enforcement. The 
body was positively identified as Ray Clerks. He had been shot in the head. Ray was the boyfriend of Pam's roommate, Shelley Norgard. To me, th th if you think that's a coincidence, there's something wrong with you, you know? Police have been searching for Pam Pitt's killer for two and a half years. The case is getting colder by the day, but the grisly discovery of Shelley Norgard's boyfriend, Ray Clerks, in a mine shaft outside Prescott, reignites the case. Ray's family knew he was missing early May. Ray Clerks was a major alibi for Shelley in the Pam Pitts case. So that started a chain of events. To follow this chain of events, Investigators rewind two years. It's spring. 22-year-old student pilot Ray Clerks and Shelley Norgard are moving in together after a year of dating. Ray liked flying. Since I've known him, it's all he's wanted to do is fly. Ray and Shelley, they both like automobiles, working on cars. He was pretty laid back. He had a sense of humor. We spent most of our time in the garage working on airplanes and things like that. So that stuff he took very seriously. Every time I see a plane fly overhead, I think of Ray. Ray earns an aviation degree and looks for work in California. He was looking around uh, John Wayne Airport to see if he can get some kind of job instructing in order to be qualified to meet the minimums for the airlines. But he cut his trip in Orange County short, and all of a sudden he had an urgency that he needed to return back to Prescott, Arizona. He says he's moving back to Orange County. He says, I'm going to go pack up my things, and I'll be back. A couple of weeks went by. We haven't heard from Ray. So my oldest brother, Benny, started making phone calls to Shelly. Shelley told them that he had gotten a job flying a plane to Mexico and had left really early in the morning. OK, well, have him call us. A couple of days later, hey, did you have Ray call us? Well, he's not here. He's doing this. He's flying an airplane over here. I mean, this dragged on for weeks. And we felt that he was always getting the runaround. Concerned about Ray, Renard and his brother Ben called the authorities in Prescott. I don't remember who the sheriff was. He goes, well, what'd your brother look like? Why would you be asking us that? Well, we pulled a body out of a mine shaft that's been there for a while. I think you two need to come down to Prescott as soon as you can. So we uh, packed up that day, and we were on the road to Prescott. As we started talking to the police officers, I started to get more and more nervous about it. I said, well, we, we, we can't show you the body because it's very decayed, but we can show you what he was wearing. I was, yeah, that's, that's his stuff. I was just numb. Police begin their investigation by matching tire tracks found at the mine entrance to a pickup recently borrowed by none other than Shelley Norgard. Shelley was interviewed. At the time of her interview in the house, they found blood. And at a certain point, they walked up to her car and could immediately smell. I think they documented it as the smell of death. They found blood in the trunk of her car that ended up being you know, the same type as Ray's. Detectives also find a 9 millimeter Luger revolver under the front seat. So they actually had some physical evidence to charge Shelley. Shelley pleads not guilty to the first degree murder of Ray Clerks. She denied that she had anything to do with his disappearance or murder. She continued with the story that he had gotten a job flying to Mexico. Despite Norgard's not guilty plea, 
The evidence is stacking up against her. A ballistics analysis shows Shelley's gun is the same caliber as the weapon used to kill Ray Clerks. It wasn't until they started collecting enough evidence where it became clear that Shelley had done it that she finally admitted to doing it. Finally, after two years of claiming she was innocent, Norgard reverses course and admits she murdered Ray Clerks. At Shelley's sentencing, her attorney had prepared a statement as to what had occurred. A large part of it was that Ray was moving. He was leaving the relationship, which enraged Shelley. They were out stargazing, and Ray was laying on top of the car. And Shelley, in her fit of rage, had grabbed the gun that was on the floorboard of her car and shot him in the head. Shelley's story about killing Ray is believable. The facts and circumstances around it, I don't believe it. I believe she killed Ray in the apartment. And then Ray's body was in the trunk of that car, and it sat out there until Shelly was able to borrow a four-wheel drive truck, go to her car, remove Ray's body, put it in the truck, drive it up the mountain to that mine shaft. Norgard is sentenced to 20 years with no parole. She's given credit for the two years she has already served awaiting trial. Her release date would be in 2011. Shelley's conviction in Ray's death now paints Shelley in a whole different light. She was a very young, cute, blonde girl who was kind of small, and it's hard to see somebody like that as a killer. Fast forward, and now suddenly she is a convicted killer. So obviously now she looks like more of a suspect in Pam's disappearance and death than she did in 1988. Shelley was in prison for 20 years. During that 20-year period, we had detectives. They kept touching base with me periodically. They kept trying to see if they could make some sense out of things or find any new leads, any new evidence that they could use. And of course, as the years went by, they've got other things to do, and it kind of gets put on the back burner. And in the meantime, you're kind of uh, in limbo over it. Forty-two-year-old Shelley Norgard completes her sentence. She moves to Nevada, marries, and hopes to forget her past. But the Yavapai Sheriff's newly appointed Lieutenant Bolts is not about to let that happen. The first time I became aware of the Pam Pitts cold case, I realized the sheer volume of information that had been gathered in the, the early stages of that case and came to a conclusion it was untenable to have somebody work on that cold case and then current cases. So it was in 2011 that I got the Pamela Pitts case. I immediately had a connection to this case because I identified with Pam as someone I would have known in high school. And had this happened to one of my friends, I, I would have been devastated. And so I felt like the, the personal conviction, compulsion to do what I could to, to solve this case. We had concluded interviews with other people who we thought might have been responsible for Pam's murder. And so we were really left with Shelley Norgard. There had to be something we missed. So from day one, that was it. What, what did we miss? What do we have that will provide us the clue we need to solve this case? In cold cases, the older they are, typically, the more material is generated in that case. So just the organization of all the photographs, the thousands of pages of reports, that's one problem. Finding your witnesses was another issue. Finding the law enforcement officers that were involved is another problem, especially in this case, 30 years later. It would take him five years, but Detective Dart eventually finds a new angle in this old case. All penal institutions in the United States pretty much all of them, record phone calls between inmates and the outside. 
So we called down to Arizona DOC and asked for any recordings that they had of Shelly. Before I even came into our investigations bureau, they collected 90-some phone calls. There was a series of phone calls between Shelly and her father where there was tension insofar as her dad was concerned that she was going to be arrested immediately upon leaving the jail. Hi. Hi. What's going on? And he kept making reference to that night, referring to the night Pam went missing. Well, that's what I've been thinking for 20 years, but then I don't know exactly. You, you've never told me what, what actually happened. <clears throat> I'm kind of up in the air again. And she comes back. I had a like moment. It. I had a huge moment. And then the line goes completely silent. It was very evident from that particular phone call that she, I wouldn't say confessed to the murder, but admitted her involvement in the murder. That was a giant aha moment that actually led me to go to the county attorney's office and seek an indictment. I got a phone call from Detective Dart, and he said, tomorrow we are going to Reno, Nevada area, and he says, we're going to arrest Shelly Norgart. I can feel the emotions right now again. To be able to tell Paul that I was arresting the person responsible for his daughter's death, that was my huge, satisfying moment. I thought it was a miracle. I think it was probably one of the best moments of my life. Ms. Norgard? Yes. Sergeant Dart. Oh, yeah, it's Harmon now. OK, Ms. Harmon, put down the seat. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you about 1988. Am I under arrest? You are under arrest for murder of Pamela Pitts. For the longest time, we have thought that Shelly killed Pam. So I was excited that they had arrested her. I was in tears. I was amazed that after 30 years, maybe we would get some justice. Shelly Norgard now known as Shelley Harmon, stands charged with the first-degree murder of Pamela Pitts. But prosecutors have a warning for the Pitts family. The county attorney's office told us, don't get your hopes up. Be prepared for a long, long legal battle. You know, my answer to that is I've waited 30 years. I can, I can see this to the end. Any time we take a case to court, especially a murder case, the defense is going to make a lot of motions. They're going to ask for a lot of hearings. They're trying to get all of that evidence precluded, and then you don't have a case at all. Shelley's attorney tries to take away the prosecution's most effective weapon. The defense attorney wanted any information regarding the Ray Clerk's case to be kept out of the trial. He didn't want anybody to know that she had been convicted of his murder and spent 20 years in prison. He argued just because she killed one person doesn't mean she killed another. And he moved that that be struck and kept out of the trial. There are numerous similarities between the two cases. In both cases, they were roommates. They were sharing bank accounts. In both cases, there was evidence of the body having been stored before it was discovered. We knew that if we won that hearing, it was going to make convicting Shelley and Pam's murder much easier. The judge makes his decision. It's a setback for prosecutors. The judge would not allow any of that information to come into the trial, which was a huge blow to our case. Anybody who's done felony cases knows about Rule 404B, and that is a rule of law that the courts use 
to evaluate whether or not a prior bad act can come into the current trial. Typically, in my experience, most prior bad acts don't come into the current trial. That really worried me because that was the absolute key to tying Shelley to Ham's murder. The old adage in prosecutions is that the longer a case gets dragged out, the better it gets for the defendant. The Pitts family weigh their options. We got together with the prosecutor. They had a trial date set, and we said, OK, if we went to trial today, what are the chances that we're going to get a conviction? All it would take was for one juror to say, no, nah, I don't believe she's guilty. And she would have walked free as if it never happened. What we decided on as a family, and I've taken a lot of criticism for this, is that we would offer her a plea deal where if she confessed to the crime and gave us the details of what happened and why, that she would be released on time served. It was more important to get the confession and the conviction behind Shelley's name than it was for the time. So we offered the plea deal. And surprisingly, she agreed to it. And so we went into court. And she stood up and she said, I murdered Pam Pitts. Shelly was upset with Pam because the checking account was overdrawn. And Shelly was really upset with Pam about her moving out because she couldn't afford to pay the rent on her own, and she didn't have anywhere to go. So Shelly was out looking for Pam, and she knew that she goes to Gordo Pitts for parties. And so when she found Pam, she confronted her. They got into a fight. She just, you know, lost it. She said, I punched her and knocked her down and got on top of her, and I, and I just kept punching and punching and punching until she stopped breathing. And then she heard voices coming, and she realized Pam wasn't moving, and she left. That was Shelly's final story. That's all we got. I don't feel that what Shelly stated in her allocution was genuine. She didn't have to say what happened afterwards, so we're led to believe that Shelly just left Pam's body out there and that somebody else came along and burned it and, you know, desecrated her body. I mean, it doesn't add up. She gave no other details, and we were not allowed to ask any questions. So the legal handcuffs, I felt, were put on us. Of course, if it were up to me, she'd be in prison for the rest of her life. But we don't live in a perfect world. She's a two-time convicted murderer. And my advice to her husband is sleep with one eye open. We got justice for Pam. And so we have to be satisfied with that. I've always got her in the back of my mind, and I think about her every single day. But I also think that she would want us to be happy and have productive lives. You don't want to ever forget your loved ones, but you also have to find a way to live with it, because we have a life to live. And you just live it better and live it for them. was a great mom as a family. We never missed birthday parties, holidays, nothing. I was fully expecting to see her with the kids at my son's birthday. But when I didn't hear from her at all, I felt like something 
bad could have happened. It just, it didn't feel right. Just the not knowing, you know, not knowing if she's okay. Oh, it was really hard. It was hard for all of us. It took a toll. I just would hope she would reach out. But I had faith that I would be able to find her. Anything I could do, I was always looking for something, anything. It's a peaceful spring morning in sleepy rural Pennsylvania when the phone rings at the Huntington County District Attorney's Office. It's a detective from a nearby town. He needs a search warrant, and he needs it now. The detective from the Altoona Police Department believed that a body was buried in Huntington County. When the detective explained things to me and said this was from 1999, there was no question about it. This was not someone who ran away. This was a homicide case. There's a body we believe to be buried on this 150-acre parcel of land in Huntington County, Borders Bar Township. So it was obviously something we wanted to get right on right away. Maybe there could be a body here and you know it's going to be in this general area, you have to find the body. The mystery dates back over 13 years. <laughs> Shelly and Sherry, with the kids, they always had big parties. We were always all together whenever those kids had a birthday, though. Our father, Shelly, Sherry, myself, and then younger brother, Sean. On this occasion, the whole family gathers at the home of Richard's sister, Shelly Nagel. The family and friends were coming over. My youngest son at the time, we were celebrating his birthday. I was leading everybody out to the back patio where we were going to have his party. I was fully expecting to see Sherry with the kids. Shelly and Richard's sister, Sherry, recently separated from her husband, Aaron. Sherry and their kids have been living with Aaron's parents. Someone rang the doorbell, and there stood Aaron, Sherry's husband, and his dad, Ken Bleedy, with my nieces and nephew. I was confused a little bit. I assumed it would have been Sherry bringing the children to the party. It was definitely out of character for Sherry to miss one of the kids, whether it been Shelly's children or her own. My dad and I asked Aaron where Sherry's at, and Aaron didn't know. And then Ken said something like, I can't believe she left the kids. Why would she leave the kids? And him and my dad had some words back and forth, and then Aaron and his dad left. Just the mere fact of not hearing from her, not even a phone call to say, you know, I'm sorry I didn't make it, that had me worried. We were raised by a single parent, our dad. We were abandoned by our mother. Dad was doing his best to make sure we all had everything we needed. We had wonderful memories. 
Going through adolescence, Sherry was shy and timid, but very loving and caring, so sweet, so kind. She's always the one to put a smile on your face. She was always happy, never really, you never seen her down. Sherry and Aaron met at the local school. That's where we all used to, like, hang out. She was 14, he was 17. And my father wasn't very happy, to say the least. She got pregnant at 15, Sherry did. She stayed in school, and she did eventually graduate. I know once she had her babies, her kids were her life, her children were her world. During that time, Aaron drove truck, so he was gone for at least a week at a time. The young couple's marriage becomes increasingly tense. The problem was Sherry was still in love with Aaron at the time. By the age of 21, Sherry had three young children. She enjoyed that very much. But I'm sure it was stressful, having three young babies running around. The fact that Aaron was never home to be part of the family, I think that's what added the stress to their relationship. After being together for seven years, Sherry finally separates from Aaron, but she can't afford her own place. She moves in temporarily with her husband's parents, the Leetes. That was very uncomfortable for her. She started working for a temp agency to save money to get out from underneath the Leetes. After she moved in with the ladies. She began dating. She started dating a, a gentleman named Ryan. Aaron caught her in this new boyfriend talking in the alley. It caused a big argument. Only a few weeks later, when Sherry misses her nephew's birthday party, her sister Shelley just can't shake a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach. My mind didn't want to believe it, but I don't know, it, it just, it didn't feel right. Dad ended up calling up at the ladies to find out, you know, where Sherry's at. The ladies had told my father that Sherry had ran off to Maine with her boyfriend. They never said who. We just automatically assumed they meant Ryan. We didn't have a phone number. We didn't have an address. We didn't know who he was. Maybe he did something to her. We didn't know. That's what was a little worrisome. My dad made the decision to go to the police. The police said, well, she's an adult, and she can leave on her own if she wants. The police in Altoona had no reason to believe that she was in danger or that a crime had been committed. Their belief was simply that she had decided to leave and have no contact with her family. Excuse me, but uh, there was nothing more important to that girl than her children. Sherry would have never left her children due to the simple fact that she was abandoned by her mother and she would never put her children through that. Her kids were her world. In my heart, in my mind, I knew something bad had happened. And 
in 1999, after Sherry went missing, the Altoona Police Department didn't seem like they wanted to do a whole lot. The police were hesitant to file a missing persons report. There were some questions regarding what actually led to her disappearance. Was it a voluntary disappearance? The Altoona Police Department did a report saying, this girl's missing. Her family doesn't know where she's at. They believe she's in Maine. Officers interview Sherry's father-in-law, Kenneth Leedy, the last known person to see Sherry. All the information was that Sherry got up to leave for work on a Friday morning. Her father-in-law, Kenneth Leedy, dropped her off where she worked. And that was the last time anyone had seen Sherry Leedy. Weeks later, there's still no sign of Sherry Leedy. With no evidence of foul play, investigators believe that she left town by choice, despite the fact that neither her children nor her family have heard from her. Whenever Sherry first went missing, maybe there was a possibility that she left for a while. But my problem was, as the time went on, and she didn't contact my father, she didn't contact her children, she didn't contact anybody. I didn't believe she'd be coming home. All right. I was around my nieces and nephews all the time. Our kids played together. After her disappearance, that, that came to an end. Her children were raised by their father and their grandfather and grandmother. And as far as I know, the ladies led them children to believe that their mother was an alcoholic and ran off with another man, and that's why she wasn't around. My dad was in contact with the police department on a regular basis. It was always they they had no answers. They haven't, you know, seen her, heard of her, nothing. I feel like he kind of like lost hope as far as getting any help from law enforcement. Whenever the police kind of gave up hope on the whole deal, I kind of did as well. By 2000, with no fresh leads, police insist that there's nothing to investigate, and the case goes cold. But Sherry's family remains deeply suspicious. I have a feeling Aaron Leedy or Ken Leedy hurt my sister, and that's the reason she's no longer around. It took a toll on all of us, just the not knowing, you know, not knowing if she's OK. It hurt all of us. It's been five long, traumatic years since Sherry's children and loved ones have seen her. The loss weighs especially heavily for her father. Our dad was definitely heartbroken over the whole ordeal. I think he felt like he let her down, like he wasn't there for her. The last time I was at the hospital with him, he said, have you heard from Sherry? I did promise him that I'm going to find her. I'm going to bring her home. He was real happy, but he passed away two days later. I had faith that I would be able to find her. Sherry had been missing for 11 years. When the social media came along, and I just thought, well, I'll just make her a page and see if that helps at all. The Facebook page is what started everything.
one of the messages I had received was from Aaron's ex-girlfriend. She claimed that my nephew said that his mother was buried on Lady's property up in Warriors Mark underneath an outhouse. For someone to say something like that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I have to tell the police this because this was something we never even heard of. They were just kind of matter of fact. I thought it was a big deal, but they didn't seem to. Frustrated by the lackluster response from the Altoona police, Shelley keeps up her own dogged search. She decides to track down Ryan, Shelley's boyfriend from the time she disappeared. I started searching on a couple social medias. I eventually came across him through, I believe it was his wife's page. But I reached out to him and asked him if he remembered Sherry. I didn't want to scare him off. He reached back out to me and said he did remember her. And the last time he saw her was when Aaron confronted him by Aaron's parents' house. Sherry had asked Ryan to leave. That was the last time he saw her. When I found Ryan, that's what started the investigation process into Sherry's disappearance. Ryan tells Shelley that her sister did not go to Maine with him back in 1999. It's a crucial detail. At Altoona Police never dug up in all these years, and it's just what they needed to heat this case up. Reaching out to Ryan was the reason that she had credibility as far as the Altoona Police Department was concerned. The original story that Sherry ran off with this guy seemed to be false. That raised a lot of eyebrows with the Altoona detectives and why they moved forward. So Shelly really gets the credit there. The Altoona Police Department decided to start investigating this cold case again. 12 years later, when they were at my door, I was happy to see them. Accepting that Sherry was likely the victim of a crime, investigators in Altoona spend the next few months gathering information from Sherry and Shelly's family and Sherry's in-laws, the Leedies. I finally get to talk to them for the first time about my sister being missing. They're also talking to Aaron, Jerry's husband. The first person of interest is the spouse. Aaron Leedy was absolutely a person of interest, and the fact that he believes she was cheating on him would have led to him possibly having motive to kill her. Police focus their attention on Aaron Leedy. Could he be behind his wife's disappearance, just as Shelley thought from the start? It seemed as if Aaron was attempting to cooperate with law enforcement the entire time, but they still had suspicions regarding Aaron. Altoona didn't think they could rule out anybody in the Lighty family at that point. The whole family would have been of interest. You don't know. There could have been a plot. There could have been more than one person involved. It takes almost a year, but Altoona detectives figure out where Sherry may be. The Altoona detective thought that the remains of Sherry Lighty were in Huntington County because the Lighty family had a farm that they used as a hunting camp in Huntington County. And he suspected someone being involved from the family. 
initially Ken Lighty had indicated to the Altoona Police Department that we could go onto the property. But then Aaron's father, Kenneth Leedy, contacted the detective from APD and said, no, you're not coming on my property without a search warrant. And that flagged us as to why that situation had changed so suddenly. The Altoona police wanted to get on that property. And they told me we had dogs coming, cadaver dogs, and we're going to search the property. All we need to do now is to get a search warrant signed by a judge. We knew if we could get on that property, we would at least have a fighting chance to find Sherry. We just didn't have enough to get a search warrant. We were pretty much at a dead end. I mean, 13 years later, there's, there's no bloody sidewalk to look at. There's no ball bat to go pick up. We didn't have anything. Detectives didn't even have Sherry's body or any clue where it might be hidden. So they devise a plan to arrange a conversation between Aaron Leedy and his father, Kenneth, one they could listen in on. District Attorney Zanik had the idea of, why don't we do a consensual phone call? What do we have to lose? Under the wiretap law in Pennsylvania, if one person agrees to make a phone call to the other, they can consent to be recorded as long as it's authorized by the district attorney. Aaron at the time knew he was still a suspect. Maybe we could find out through Aaron what Kenneth knew. In an effort to clear his own name, Aaron agrees to help investigators target his father. Aaron agreed to call his father to see if Kenneth would talk about the case. Aaron was very nervous. I think part of Aaron was always afraid of his father. We talked about a script, so to speak, to get his dad to talk about the case. Look, Dad, I'm a suspect here, too. What do you know? What aren't you telling me? All the documents were completed. Recording devices were set up on the phone. We made the call from the state police barracks investigation room. We thought we only had one chance to find out what happened on that day that Sherry disappeared 13 years ago. Only two people stayed in the room with Aaron. We listened from outside the room to Aaron make the call to his father. Police record Aaron's covert conversation with his father, Kenneth. But Kenneth dodges his son's questions. There were actually two phone calls. The first phone call, Aaron speaking to his father, who's not being cooperative. And he's getting agitated with Aaron. He said, I can't talk here. I have to go somewhere else. Mr. Kenneth Leedy was the last person to have had physical contact with Sherry Leedy when she went missing. We knew Sherry was uncomfortable around Ken Leedy because he was really touchy-feely. He would touch her hair. There was just some really odd behavior. It was kind of creepy that your daughter-in-law. I heard plenty of creepy stories of Ken peeking under covers when he thinks Sherry was sleeping. Creepy actions for an older man to a younger woman. We have Aaron calls father back the second time. During that second phone call, Ken is, again is agitated, doesn't really want to answer questions. Aaron was upset on the phone. His dad was upset on the phone. And out of the blue, Kenneth said, I did it. 
It was the most stunning moment of my legal career. He had just confessed to a homicide that happened 13 years ago. The, the feeling was gut-wrenching. We just had this guy tell us he killed somebody 13 years ago, and nobody ever knew she was dead. And at that point, everything changed. He qualified it by saying it was an accident. No one in that room or that barracks or anyone that was working that case believed that it was an accident. The call continues. Aaron continues to question him about it and ask, you know, where is she? Ken says she's on the farm. In the fence row on the farm. Kenneth indicated that he had buried her in a rock pile, or, or words to that effect. All we need to do now is to get a search warrant and just simply find the rock pile. That's when I sent troopers and the detectives up to Altoona to interview Ken at his residence that evening. Kenneth Levy remains completely unaware that his conversation with his son had been recorded earlier in the day. He didn't know what we had. He was seated on the couch. They questioned him about Sherry's disappearance. The demeanor was defiant. One of the detectives told Mr. Leedy, look, you're coming with us. You're going to the state police barracks for further questioning. At this point, Mr. Leedy leaps from the couch and starts to run. He had indicated that his intentions were to run upstairs where he had a gun, and he was going to kill himself. He assaulted a police officer, knocked the police officer to the ground, Pennsylvania State Trooper. There's a slight scuffle. They tackle him into residence. He was handcuffed, placed on the ground outside of the residence, and Mr. Leedy was placed in the Blair County Prison with aggravated assault charges against the troopers and the detective. But Kenneth remained silent, refusing to cooperate in any way. And investigators know that the taped phone confession won't be enough to make a murder charge stick. We got the search warrant that evening, and we knew we couldn't search until the next morning. And it was a sleepless night for me. There was just this anticipation that we were going to find Sherry, and we're going to get justice for this family. We first stepped foot on the property shortly after 8 AM. Everyone had high hopes that we were going to find this missing lady in fairly short order. But we were looking for a rock pile, and there were rock piles everywhere. We were looking on a piece of property that had 150 acres and multiple places to bury a body. We weren't just going to search this property like we would search a house in a drug case. Aaron Lighty joined us, showed us the fence row he thought his father was talking about during the phone call. Multiple fence rows pretty much lined the property in different intervals. Ken Lighty, he had a hunting stand there. The sense was that should be the starting point. We had been in contact with the Pennsylvania State Police canine unit, and we had a cadaver dog. Because the body had been in the ground for so many years, the scent would travel, and it could be 200 yards away. You could dig and dig and dig, but you still may not find the body. We realized pretty quickly this wasn't going anywhere. The search dragged on that day with little results. It's a daunting task to try to figure out where is she. And there was a resolve by everybody that we're not leaving this ground until we find her. We were emotionally charged up. We are going to find Sherry, and we're going to bring her home. 
After being missing for 13 long years, Sherry Leety may soon be found as police continue their search for her body on her father-in-law's property. We've contacted Dr. Dennis Dirkmatt from the Mercyhurst University for his forensic anthropology team to come and collect evidence for us. The Pennsylvania State Police we're looking for a set of human remains. I brought along my team from Mercyhurst to conduct a full-scale excavation. I did get the impression that Neith and the Pennsylvania State Police were determined to find her. Without a body, detectives face an uphill struggle, making the murder charge stick. Unless they can track down Sherry's remains, Kenneth Leedy could escape justice. Eventually, there were between 50 and 100 people on the property searching from early morning until dusk. Sneath's up there. He's working his butt off to find me my answers. And, and I'm very grateful. Unfortunately, we weren't having any success. As the week progressed, hope diminished and doubt started to set in. We started to become defeated at this point. With no sign of a breakthrough, Pennsylvania State Police have no choice. They have to call off the search. After we searched the property for the, the first week, the decision was made by myself and my superiors that it was time for us to pull off the property The next idea, really the last straw, was to go to Kenneth and his attorneys and make a deal. If you take us to Sherry's body, we would be willing to make a plea deal to third degree murder as opposed to first degree murder. I agree with his decision. It wasn't made lightly. The maximum penalty at the time on third degree murder was a sentence of seven to 14 years. I was very angry. I didn't understand why they had to make a deal with him. And without asking the family first how we felt. Does he deserve a deal? No, the man don't. He took somebody's life. After signing the plea deal, Kenneth Leedy finally tells detectives the horrific truth about Sherry's last moments. I'm gonna to read to you from the transcribed statement of Mr. Kenneth Leedy. As we were heading out the front porch, I said to her, are you coming home to be a mother this weekend or are you gonna to continue to be a bar whore? She just simply kind of turned and said, well, Fuck you. And I said, fuck you. And I gave her a shove. The shove, it was forceful. It was forceful, and she hit her head, right side of her head, on my truck, I believe the mirror, and fell face first on the left side of her head onto the sidewalk. According to him, he panicked and decided he was getting rid of the body. So he drove from Altoona to Warriors Mark to his property. Ken had to show the Pennsylvania State Police where Sherry was on the property. My troopers went to the Blair County Prison, picked up Mr. Leedy, transported him to this property. The feeling that I had seeing him there was really anger. Mr. Leedy and I began walking around the area of this old fence row. He pointed out two locations. I remember saying, OK, Ken, tell me which one I should start looking at. He was handcuffed. He raised his hand and pointed 
and said, I would start there. I started throwing rocks off the pile. A void appeared. As I leaned forward on the rocks, I was on all fours and I could look down in the hole. There's a bone in that hole. We knew we had found Sherry Light. For years, Sherry had been on that ground. For years, Ken Lighty walked past her gravesite hunting. For years, that family had been on that property. Kenneth was saying it was an accident. We didn't have any forensics to show that it was a homicide. And now we can do the autopsy and the forensic exam to get answers, to see who's telling the truth. Now that Sherry Leete's remains have been found, forensic experts focus on determining the precise medical cause of her tragic death. As we were excavating, we could see that both legs were folded up, basically almost to the chin. Even the best contortionists couldn't do that. That told us that maybe the body was somewhere else, Somebody had noticed the smell, then he had gathered up the remains and then buried her. Dr. Dirkmet's team carefully secured Sherry's remains to be transported back to Mercyhurst University. At the laboratory, the process would be a review of every bone surface that we have to see if there's any evidence of trauma. The right side of the face showed significant fracturing showed more damage and probably was a point of impact. This side was also damaged, um, but probably because it was either against the ground or against the wall or something like that. And so you have a significant force here and then created many fractures here, many fractures here that ran through the, through the skull. Her skull was crushed. There was no question about that. It was blunt force trauma. You can imagine almost anything. Hitting her with a baseball bat, maybe, or a pipe. The trauma was so extensive that would have led to her death. Detectives put more pressure on Kenneth Leedy to explain how he committed his heinous crime. Kenneth viewed the pictures of the remains. He then remembered something but he didn't know what being in his hands towards Sherry. A conclusion can be drawn that he's remembering where he struck her with some object. He never was able to tell us or never wanted to tell us what that object was. Kenneth was finally sentenced to seven to 14 years. The 66-year-old Kenneth Leedy was brought into the courtroom with hands cuffed and legs shackled. During the formal sentencing, a sister of his victim spoke directly to the convicted killer. Okay. My, my family has been through living hell these past 14 years, not knowing what happened to Sherry. We knew she would have never left her young children. Not only did this monster take away their mother, but he lied to them for all these years, blaming Sherry, knowing all along he killed my sister. He has no conscience, no soul. I, I lost a sister, but they lost a mother. Sherry's most basic right, her right to life, was cruelly and unjustly taken from her.
I told him I thought what he did is inexcusable. What he put those children through is unimaginable. When we finally got her home, we did have a memorial service for her. And um, she was then buried with our father. I felt like we were finally all together again. By 2020, Kenneth Leedy has served seven years, making him eligible for parole. Outraging Sherry's surviving family, who are still grieving 21 years after her murder. Every year we have to worry because he's up for parole. It's just not fair for him to be able to get out and live a normal life after taking a life. When Kenneth Leedy came up for his first parole hearing in 2020, I did speak in front of the parole board. I did start a petition. The first hearing, I think I had over 2,000, and the second hearing, I had over 7,000. I would hope that one day I would be able to sit with all three of them, her children, and just answer any questions that they have about their mother. I miss Sherry a lot, and I know that she's, she's finally at rest. And, and I know she's with our dad.